Imagine a new beautiful facility at 601 Favor Street, built for our community, being used by our community, and shining bright as a testimony of the faithfulness of the Lord. A place where families and friends gather for fun and fellowship. A hub that connects neighbors, churches, schools, and a city together. Hundreds, maybe even thousands of our capstone family connecting, doing good, and worshiping. Hundreds of new leaders raised up and released as missionaries where they work, learn, live, and play. A Christ-centered environment that people see is a place of hope, grace, and love. All right, well, good morning. My name is Walt Tanner, one of the pastors here at Capstone, and we are glad that you're hanging out with us here at 601 Fairview Street or you're watching online. Uh, hopefully, as you came in, you were able to grab uh, your, kingdom, uh, your kingdom spiritual roadmap, or if you got one last week, you brought it back. Uh, we're going to be in uh, week two, uh, which is called The Plan, uh, and so your sermon notes will be in there. Uh, also, if you were able to take uh, part in our devotions this week, they, again, they were in our spiritual roadmaps. Uh, if you didn't like it, uh, I stole it from somebody else. If you loved it, I came up with everything that you read. Um, but no, I, actually, it's a little bit of both. Um, Mike Breen, who's someone who's spoken here at Capstone and, and someone who's poured into me, uh, he wrote this book called Oikonomics, uh, How to Invest in Life's Five Capitals the Way Jesus Did. And this is really about economics of the gospel. Uh, it's about how to be a family on mission and what it really looks like to invest resources, but understanding of how to these five capitals, uh, which you'll learn about actually if you do them this week, you'll learn about uh, the spiritual, the physical, the uh, relational, the intellectual, and the uh, financial capitals, and how the world normally says your financial capital is how you measure success, but ultimately Jesus would say financial capital is the least valuable of all that we have. And how you use that financial capital to grow intellectual capital, how to grow uh, relational capital, how to grow spiritual capital. And so we encourage you, if you'd like to learn more about kind of if you like this devotional, uh, I'd encourage you to pick this up. We've got them at the bridge. Uh, great small, re it's a small investment with a great reward. So uh, we'll keep in, in that theme. If you're a guest here today, we're glad that you're hanging out with us, glad that you've accepted the invitation to come or, or to watch. Uh, we will give you a warning. We are talking about money, all right? Uh, and so, uh, we don't like, no, we don't, it's not something we talk a lot about. We don't pass a plate. We, we don't do anything like that. But today we are talking about money because we're talking about uh, making a kingdom investment. So we're talking about advance the kingdom. And we spent the last several weeks uh, having conversations about what's it look like to have a kingdom expansion here at 601 Barry Street that blesses our city. And we've, we, on Sunday mornings, uh, we're studying the book of Nehemiah. And last week we started, started with this vision that was born out of, a, uh, out of a burden to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And so the, the walls have been uh, destroyed by the Babylonians and they come and they take uh, Israel into exile, which by the way, in Deuteronomy, God said that is what would happen. Uh, so God was faithful. They left him. They, they turned away from him. Uh, they were taken into exile and, and begins this journey for Nehemiah. Nehemiah hears about this burden of the brokenness of the wall. He is, he is literally from the inside out, tore up. So he spends four months praying on behalf of Israel. We saw that last week in, in chapter one. And in behalf of Israel, he says, God, you were faithful. You kept your word. We, uh, we messed up. Uh, we did not focus on you. We, we focused on ourselves. And so we were sitting about, but you also said in Deuteronomy that you said that if we come back to you, that you would gather us again. And that's my prayer. And so we talked about last week how that burden that he had, uh, it, it wells up from the inside out, which by the way, that's how God works. He plants a seed in you and it comes out. He's not clean up the outside and fool everybody that you're religious, but the idea that, that, you, were the front, that you were transformed from the inside out. So from the inside for four months, and then finally it comes out and the king, the Persian king who he serves, he says, hey dude, what's wrong? You're normally full of joy. You're normally one, you're a light, but something's different today. And he says, why wouldn't I be upset because the city of my ancestors lays in ruins. And the king says, hey, what can I do to help you? He says, I'm gonna reward you for your faithfulness, for your loyalty. He says, would you allow me to leave to help rebuild the walls? And the king says, yes. He says, what do you need? And the king gives him the resources to, to rebuild the wall. Here we see God use a pagan king, a secular pagan king to rebuild the sacred, the city of Jerusalem, the city of David. And so we begin to see how God uses the secular and the sacred and how those two things work together. And we share just basically our connection for the, for the burden of our community. 
the burden. There are so many people stumbling around in the darkness, trying to seek happiness, trying to find fulfillment from this world. The success is based on what the world tells them success is. And the idea that we want to point them to the hope of the world in Jesus Christ. And the idea that we want to create this vision just not to, to make more room for church, but how can we build a community center that a church meets at? The idea that, yes, on Sunday mornings, we use it as a gospel community, as a launching pad to send you guys out as missionaries where you work, love, and play. But six days a week, this place is full of laughter and joy and sweat and tears and, and conversations and, and the idea of prayer and the idea of Bible studies and the idea that, man, we're training foster parents, the idea that we're you and 90 families, the idea that we're ESL class or whatever it may be that God uses here. But they say, hey, at 601 Fairview Street, this is a hub for the gospel. And so as we talked about that, that this place is just not known as a house of worship, but a sacred place that helps meet the secular needs. It's just not a holy place because it has a steeple or has a pew or has a stained glass or we sing worship songs or we have a choir or we do preaching. But the idea that it's holy because it'll be built by a holy people for a holy God in order to point more people to this holy God. That's why it's holy. Not because necessarily it's gonna look like a church, but the idea that you as a people we want to focus on not idea of building a place, but equipping people to build a better people who understand why we are called to do what we were called to do. So did, uh, this week we've been having conversations. Wednesday and Friday we did our community launch and we shared some images and you'll see a few more of those images up there. This is the idea of expansion that we would add a uh, space and we had a, ha a, a half an acre of, of green space for our community. We'd add a gym that we'd move worship into. Um, but the understanding that we had uh, conversations with you guys and conversations with city leaders and conversations with other people from other churches who are praying for us and the idea that what does that look like? And so as we had these conversations, we, we've heard that, hey, this is different, or we've never heard anyone do it like this, or, or the idea that, um, that where did this come up from? And we just said, look, this is about a burden for our community. That we want to say, hey, Fountain Inn is growing at a rapid pace, which means there are more people here, and this is an opportunity for us to share the gospel with maybe them not even ever coming on Sunday morning. That we're having gospel conversations at a new coffee shop or gospel conversations while our kids are playing basketball or the idea that we're able to, to have a prayer box and we're praying for people as every day they're putting in prayer requests and, and we're just simply following up with their prayers. What does that look like that we have a burden and we say, this is for us what that would look like? And so as we, as we uh, pick up in Nehemiah, so he shared the, the burden. And so we've kind of been sharing that burden. He talked about the vision. We've been talking about that vision. And today's the plan. So we see Nehemiah uh, begin to work on that plan. So we're in Nehemiah 2 today. Uh, we're going to start in verse, let me see, I think it's verse 11. That's right. We're in verse 11, and we're going to read 11, 12, and 13. If you're following along, uh, Robbie, go ahead and pull up the light. So if they have a Bible, they can follow along. We know it's dark. Uh, there we go. This is brighter than the old Bilo we used to be in, all right? Some of us remember that, and you literally had to get out your phone to be able to read any Bible. All right, so here we go. Verse 11. So I went to, the Jerusal I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. When I rose in the night, I had a few men with me, a.k.a. security. And I told, I told no one what my God put on my heart to do for Jerusalem. So remember, this burden on his heart is for Jerusalem, for the people of Israel, he prays this prayer. He says, God, I come and confess on behalf of Israel, the people of Israel. I come here now for the people of Jerusalem. He isn't doing this so he gets a book deal. He's not doing this to get fame. He's just simply doing this out of a burden. And that's what he says. Look, I didn't tell anyone what God put on my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the, the dragon spring and to the dung gate. Sounds like Lord of the Rings. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem, and there were broken down, and its gates had been destroyed by fire. And then he keeps on going, and he goes through the gates, and he begins to go through the, uh, all the places that he begins to see in the wall. And so here, your first fill in the blank, if you're keeping notes, is again, the problem. So last week, we started with a problem where it was told to him of what was wrong with the wall. Now he's seen it with his own eyes. He doesn't ride into Jerusalem and say, hey, guys, I'm here to fix the wall. No, he comes in and he takes time to see the damage with his own eyes. Remember, Nehemiah has been praying for, for four months, maybe now it's up to six months, that he's been making preparations. He's had conversation with the king. He's had follow-up meetings. He's got a whole list of, of things that he's going to need, the resources to rebuild the wall. And he covertly surveys the situation. He begins to make plans. 
Normally we do the opposite. Normally you come up with these great ideas and we just say, hey, here's the idea. And, and people are like, well, how are we going to do it? And what's that going to look like? We don't have the wisdom of a solid plan. And we normally jump out in front and don't have and understand what it looks like. Jesus talks about this in Luke 14. He talks about disciples. He says, hey guys, if, if you're going to follow me, it, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging. You're going to have to leave some things behind. You're going to have to leave maybe an old life or an old relationship. You're, you're going to have to make hard choices if you're going to follow me. And Jesus says, you're going to have to decide, me or the world. And what he says in uh, Luke 14, you see it up on the screen, Luke 14, 28. For which of you desiring to build a house does not first sit and sit down and, and count the cost whether he has enough to complete it? He's talking about discipleship, but this is a good word for all of us. That if we're building a house, make sure that we got enough money. Or we're going to get married, or we're going to start a family, or we're going to take that job, or whatever it may be. The idea of going, look, understand that when you have this drive to do something, that you've got to have a plan. you got to understand that there's gonna, it's going to cost you something. And sometimes, as we talk about the capital, it may cost you financially. It may cost you spiritually because you decide to make a poor choice. And, and it begins to allow the darkness to, over, to, to, to penetrate the, the light. What's it look like in understanding the cost of what it means? So here's, so this is what Nehemiah does. He goes, man, all right, I'm going to take a few days. I'm going to, I'm going to run some numbers. going to make sure we've got everything in place and kind of come up with a plan of, man, how are we going to do all this stuff? And as he does that, then he, he gathers everybody together. And for us, this is what we've been doing for the last few weeks. It is what we've been doing for the last year is sharing what we've been planning that we've sat down with numerous banks, that we have sat down with contractors and run cost analysis of what, uh, how much rebar and how much plumbing is going to cost and how much it's going to cost to do all the things. That we came up with these numbers. It wasn't an arbitrary number like mm, $5 million. That's fine. But the idea of going, what does it look like? We took cost. And we begin to go, okay, well, what does this look like? How do we plan this out? How do we begin to look? Like? So we've been play, planning, and that's what we've been sharing with you guys. And that's why we did this publicly. Because we didn't want you to go, well, they're just dreaming. And we came back, and just honestly, the first number we came up with was $2 million. Banks were like, well, you guys can build something for $2 million. And we were like, all right, well, that's awesome. And then we went back to the contractor, like, you can't build anything for $2 million. All right, well, back to the drawing board. So then we had to go back and had to begin to talk to other people and begin to look at other ways of, of resourcing and financing and, and all that good stuff, which we're, we've been sharing with you guys. But we wanted to say, look, these guys aren't dreamers, but we're doers. So like Nehemiah does, we've been having these conversations and, and sometimes you have questions and we want to have those answers. And it's been great to have dialogue with some of you guys about that. But Nehemiah gathers everybody together and he shares his plan, verse 17. He said, then I said to them, so he's gathered the leaders, he's gathered the people who were invested in Jerusalem. He says, look, I said to him, you see the trouble we're in? How Jerusalem lies in ruins with his gates burned? Come, let us build a wall. For, uh, let's build us a wall for Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer. And then I told, them, uh, I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good. And also the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. So he rides in and he ultimately says, hey guys, I don't know if you noticed, but the wall is broken. The gates are burned. He said, let's rebuild. And everybody goes, thank you, Captain Obvious, all right? We've been here a lot longer than you. You've been here a few days. You've established that the wall's broken. You know what? There have been lots of people who've tried to rally the troops to rebuild the wall, and every time has fallen flat on its face. There have been lots of people who've come in with great intentions, but they didn't have a plan. And then verse 18, if you go back and look at verse 18, he says this, but the hand of my God is with me. He began to share, look, this is what God put on my heart. I just didn't come here riding in and see the walls are broken and tell you. No, I've been praying for months upon months after months. I've been fasting. I've been seeking the Lord. I, I went and had a conversation with the king of Persia, basically who rules the world. And he has shown favor and he's actually going to put the money and resources to pay for it. So he begins to say, look, I've got a plan. I'm just not telling you. I'm just not shooting from the hip. I'm just not a dreamer. That I've sought the Lord for months and months and months. He's shown favor on me. He's allowed the king to walk alongside of us. He's going to provide the resources for it. And then they look at each other and go, all right. It says, he says, let's rise up and build. And they said, where do we begin? And it says they linked arms 
They strengthened their hands. It says they went to work. And so as we begin to understand the call, and so first we had the problem, this was the call. So he puts this calls out. The call is this, he's going, hey, look, here's the problem. Here's the plan. Now, will you join me? Will you join me in that we can restore what is broken? Will you join me that we can rebuild and to begin to make the city of David, the holy temple could be safe and that we could be in the, the dwelling place of the Lord, the holy of holies to be rebuilt. But it starts with this wall, guys. And they look at each other and say, man, let's rise up. Let's build. Now let's fast forward a few thousand years. Jesus enters the world. He looks at the nations and the world and says, look, your heart is destroyed. The only way to rebuild you is to give you a new heart. Jesus comes and says, here's the problem. The problem is you are sinners in need of a savior. He says, this is the good news that I will give you a new heart. Because in the New Testament, it's no longer about a wall or a temple. In the New Testament, it's about you and it's about me. And Jesus comes and says, hey, let me rebuild you. Let me give you a new life, a new family, a new heart. Jesus says, I want to redeem you. I want to restore you. I want to make you the way God intended you to be. You see, everything Nehemiah did is pointing to Christ, a redemptive story. But now it's no longer about bricks and mortar. It's now about flesh and blood and spirit and goodness. That he is giving you a new heart. He has given us a new identity. He is giving us a new family. If, if you're here today or you're watching and you don't know Christ, that's what it means to be a Christ follower. It doesn't mean coming to church. It doesn't mean having a big Bible. It doesn't mean checklist. It's just not going to church. This idea that I'm not a, just a church goer, I'm a Christ follower, and now I've given my life to him. And in gratitude, now we live a life of service. We live for the opportunity to bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. This opportunity for us when he shows us to say, let's rise up and build. Let's rise up and build orphanages. Let's rise up and build hospitals. Let's rise up and build in the name of Christ things that ultimately point to him. He invites us to say, here's the problem. Here's the brokenness. Here's the chance for you to redeem your city. Here's the chance for you to reach more people with the gospel. Here's the chance for you to share that you care about people who don't necessarily can pay you back. Because guess what? That's our story. We can't pay Jesus back. We can't give enough. Our church can never grow enough. The idea that we can never pay back. And he says, look, here's how you pay it forward. When the kingdom opportunities come, you say yes. You say, let's rise up and build. And over the years, we've been able to rise up and build. And we've built orphanages. And we've started churches. And we've started nonprofits. And, and we've been able to do a lot of amazing things in the journey. And now we stand and Jesus says, all right, here it is on a platter. Capstone family. It looks different. Hey, it's out of the box thinking, but here's your opportunity maybe just to show a little bit, one tool to add to spiritual revival here in our city, an opportunity to advance the kingdom, unlike our city's ever seen before. The idea of a partnership with our community, the idea of a partnership to bless our city and to better our city, the idea of going, hey, it's on a platter. But we as a Capstone family rise up and that we would say, yes, let us build. We see our city growing at a rapid pace that the mission field is growing here, more and more opportunity to share the gospel. And when we can say, hey, what's God doing at 601 Fairview Street? Man, we're just seeking the welfare of the city in order to point more people to Jesus. That's why we do what we do. And so we have told you guys, and if you haven't heard, like I mentioned before, that this, the, expen the, the idea of the budget's a $5 million budget. And that's a big number, and just kind of let that sink in. We've, we've allowed that to sink in, and, and we've kind of had the conversations, and we've wrestled with the numbers, and we've looked at interest rates, and we've looked at all that good stuff. So $5 million for us and staff and leadership and elders, like that's something that we've kind of been walking with a few months. But for you, that's a big number, unless you look at Clemson's new board that costs $20 million. I'm like, well, if they got that for $20 million, then we should be able to get $5 million pretty easy. So if anybody would like to give to IFTA to forward it to us, we take it. But anyway. But the idea of going $5 million and what we could do with $5 million and understanding that I've doubted along the way because I'm a realist and, and I just kind of connect dots and I look at the numbers and I look at how many people give. and I, Well, actually, I don't look at that, but Chris tells me how many people give and he tells like, here's our numbers and here's our percentages. And I'm just like, I just, I, it leaves me head scratching. 
But I'll just be honest, when we started this whole thing, I was like, if, when we started this church in Fountain Inn, man, if 20 people come, 30 people come, 50 people come, man, that'll be amazing. And I was like, we'll never have over 100 people. We'll never have over 200 people. We'll never have over 300 people. And then the pandemic come. And I was like, we'll never have over 200 people again. We'll never have over 300 people again. And here we are with over 300 people again. And along the way, there's no way we can merge with a 100-year-old church. That'll never work. There's no way we can build an orphanage in Haiti and buy five acres and be able to, to build a whole new compound for Pastor Andy. There's, there's no way we could plant churches. There's no way we could add on. There's no way. And, and God the whole time is like, hey, oh, ye of little faith. He's like, if I give you the vision, remember when, when Nehemiah gets the vision, God just says, hey, I want you to lead this charge. He never said how he was gonna do it. And that's kind of where we're at. Like we've made the plan. We, we've we've, we've kind of looked it out and we're casting this vision. And this is where the faith piece comes in. I'm like, hey, you may think we're crazy. I kind of think we're crazy. But this is where we see God do amazing stuff. We've been able to do only what God can do because we want to say, hey, God, it, it, well, there's no way to work. When we planted the church in Clinton, I, I, I can remember where we were sitting at the old Bilo, and I, we looked at leadership. I said, hey, I think we should plant a church. We were three years old, and, and one of the folks looked at me and said, look, well, we don't have people, we don't have time, and we don't have money. There's no way we can start another church. I said, we'll never have enough time, we'll never have enough people, we'll never have enough money. Let's see what God does. And there's a thriving church in Clinton because we took that step of faith. And so here we are now going, all right, let's see what God can do only uh, what only he can do. And so again, so here's kind of where we're at. Next weekend is what we're calling Commitment Sunday. It's Commitment Weekend, and, and we're going to start it out with a time of, of worship together, a prayer and fellowship and, and song and just a, a, a holy time to begin. Go, God, what are you calling us to do? Because we really believe it starts with worship and prayer. And then we're going to, next Sunday, we're, we're giving out the whole commitment deal and, and kind of pledges of the idea of going, and again, if you're new to here, this isn't for you. If you've just been hanging out before our Capstone family, to say, hey, in the next 36 months, how can we invest? How can we make a commitment to, to give to this? We're looking, the idea that in 2022, that we're, that's our first fruits time. So in the next year, if you, and by the end of this year, if you'd like to give or end of the year or whatever, that's kind of what we're calling first fruits. So 2022, there's this fir, first fruit piece. The, the commitments don't start till January, 2023. The reason we want you to do that is we want you to budget. We want you to plan. We want you when that, when it sits over to 2023, begin, okay, here's the number that God put on our heart and here's how, we don't really know how it's gonna work, but let's begin to, to budget. So we're giving you about three or four months to begin to, to say, hey, here's where that looks. But as, as we do that, the big God size number, which is another big number to swallow, is a million dollars. That, that in the next few weeks that we would take commitments and for, we've had people from the community say, hey, I don't go to Capstone, but we'd love to invest in this because we think it's gonna bless our community. To you guys going, hey, what's it look like for us to, to be able to go, man, we're, we're gonna see 36 months that we would see on top of our tithes and offerings, a million dollars come in in order to do that. And, and we don't, I'll just be honest, we don't like asking for money. That's why we don't pass plates here. Chris and I do not like fundraising. We, that's why we hired somebody last time to help us do it that we don't like it. But here's what we learned last time when we did the whole $300,000 and you guys did that, paid it off in two years. God was amazing in that. Here, here's what God did in that. They, God showed us and revealed to us, we're not asking something from you guys. We're inviting something and, and want something for you. That we want you to be able to invest. We want you to be able to sacrifice. We want you to receive the blessings that so many of us have who've walked this journey before. We want something for you in the sense of not from you. This isn't, this, again, same thing for Nehemiah. It's not to promote us. It's, it, this is his church, not ours. And the idea of what we're investing in. And we want you to invest in something that you believe will leave a lasting impression. All right, three, three quick points of, of kind of where this leads us. One, uh, leaving a lasting legacy. We want to leave a lasting legacy. During the 1800s and 1900s, um, the church saw the value of education. Therefore, the church started schools. The, the churches saw the need of, of health care, so they built hospitals. They built orphanages to take care of the sick and the vulnerable. They built affordable housing. The church saw the needs in the community, and because we serve a holy God, and because we're the hands and feet of Christ, and Jesus says, when you clothe the naked, you do it to me, that when you house the homeless, you do it for me. When you give them even a drink of water, and you do it to me, that the church took responsibility for the brokenness of the community and said, you know what? We're gonna create this legacy 
And they built universities and they built colleges and they built, they built hospitals and orphanages. And they built all these things in order to bring the kingdom on earth that is in heaven. And here's our question. How can we sacrifice and serve our community so that we can shine bright? For you to begin to say, yes, let's rise up and let's build. Not for our glory, but for his not, not so that people look to the caption and say, man, that's a great church. No, so, no, we serve a great God. That's why we're doing this. And the understanding that leaving this lasting legacy that will outlast you, your kids, and your grandkids, and to say, look, not one person built this. A family built this. They linked arms together and built this. And, and they weren't billionaires. They were school teachers and nurses and shop workers they were doing the little things in order to sacrifice so that they could build this. Now again, experts say, we know budgets are tight. And that's why we're giving you a few months to, to figure that out. We know we're on the edge of possibly a recession. The experts would say, this is not the, the time to do a fundraising campaign. Just remember, we launched in the great recession. Great time to start a church. But God was faithful. And so we, we, don't, we believe God's bigger than a recession. God's bigger than stock markets. God, we know, and we're all facing those things. But if we live in fear, we'll never see God do the miraculous. The next is this, is next steps. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna ask you that you would take your next step of obedience. If you don't know Jesus, that's where you start. Like that's ultimately, if you don't know Christ, we would say that's the first step. And let's have that conversation. I wanna teach you and, and show you, this is what it means to point you to him and, and give your life to him. For those of us that are Christ followers, just beginning to go, hey, where do we start? And I'd say, if, you're, if, you, if you haven't started tithes and offerings, that's where you start. That you would bring your, you would bring your resources to say, hey, God, how can you use this? And, and, and begin to, to help fund the, the mission and vision of Capstone that goes all over the world to share the gospel. For others, if you're not a regular giver, you're just kind of random give here and there, that you say, hey, I'm gonna become a regular giver. And the idea of going, hey, what's it like above our tithes and offerings that our family could give? And now please hear me say this. God does not love you if you give him more money. That's not what we're saying. God says, hey, look, I love you because I sent you Christ. This isn't, we're not buying God's love. It's not the idea that we're gonna give money in order that he's gonna make us healthy and we're gonna keep our jobs. The idea is going, God, you have given to me, you have blessed me, you have given me the greatest capital that I could ever have in salvation and because of that, I want to, I, again, I want to be able to serve your kingdom. I want to bring, I want to advance the kingdom. And this is an opportunity for you to do that. So what are those next steps? In your spiritual roadmaps, uh, this past week, we talked about generosity in your, in, your, um, in your devotions. And the idea of commitment and, uh, and, and the idea of going, what's it look like? That, that I, could, I could see this opportunity. Unfortunately, a lot of us are chasing the American dream. And when these opportunities come up, they go, well, I don't have any resources. I don't have anything extra. And God would say, well, is it because you're more focused on your priorities for you or for me? Now, I'm going to be honest. That's a challenge. That's a challenge that we as a family have had to look at. We had to look at our budget. We had to look at our spending. We had to look at where we are in resources. I'm kind of going, man, am I, am I giving God my leftovers? Or am I giving God a tip? That's not what he asked for. He says, bring me your first fruits, which means, hey, you know what? From the very get-go, the idea of going, hey, God, this is not mine, this is yours. And listening to whatever, how he calls you to lead, to give. Again, the idea that we would use this muscle of generosity. We would use this muscle for generosity. Because too often we, we don't use it and we just kind of sit on the sideline. But every time you give, and I've learned this over the years, every time I give radical generosity, man, it makes it a whole lot easier the next time. And every time I get to do something for somebody else, man, I, I, that, the Holy Spirit just goes, well done and good and faithful servant. Again, not because I've quote unquote given money to God, but because, man, because I have been obedient and faithful. Our goal is not to get a building. Our goal is to build better disciples. And when we are radically generous with what God has blessed us, by the way, money is the thing that we hold on to the tightest. I'll come serve on Sundays. I'll, I'll come go to a community group. I'll come do all these things. But the idea that, man, I've got to let go of some of, of, of my money, which is what we say, I work for it. It's my money. And I would say scripturally, it's not yours. It's all his. And he can take it back at any moment, at any time. Some of us have felt that. Some of us have experienced that. But the idea that it is his. And so what is the next step for you in your generosity, in your journey? And then last, be creative. We have a creative God. So don't go, oh, well, Walt, I don't have any extra money. Go, well, then all right, be creative in what God has called you to do. It might be a yard sale or a side hustle. 
It, it, it may not be sacrificed for you. It may be some of you guys are really good businessmen and businesswomen. And the idea of go, man, I, I'm, I'm a good realtor. You know what? In the next 36 months, I'm gonna close five extra deals and I'm gonna give every profit of those five extra deals to this. Or the idea that, you know what? I don't have a lot of resources, but I'm a really good conversation people and I work with other people who do have resources. And you know what? This would be a great something they would love to invest in. So I'm gonna go buy their lunch. I'm gonna invest capital resources into them, share this vision with them and see if they would, might wanna invest in that. Be creative in the way that God calls you and he has gifted you and talents. Sometimes it is not spending so much on Amazon. Guilty. All right, be creative. There's a, uh, there's a page that says six ways to save some money. Um, I told my wife, uh, she was an inspiration for one of those. It says, uh, it says um, do online shopping or curbside pickup. Uh, this is basically saying my wife doesn't go into Target uh, because she goes to buy detergent and $150 later, uh, we just have all this other stuff. And I was like, just, you know what? Say, hey, we need toilet paper and detergent. And then you go pick it up and they put it in your car and you don't even have to get out of your car. So, um, so that may be one creative way that you begin to do that. There are lots of different ways. There's a 52-week giving uh, savings challenge. Google it. Uh, you save the first week, you save a dollar. Second week, you save $2. Third week, you'll save $1,300 uh, uh, $1, uh, in one year if you just do that. Do that with your kids. Go, hey, guys, kids, every, every time we're going to put, every week we're going to put $1, $2, and allow them to see how that jar is really big. And at the end of the year, go, man, how about that we can give this to help build what God has put on our heart? Be creative in how you begin to go, man, I want to invest this into my kids because this isn't just that there'll be a building here for generations. It's that you teach your kids about tithing and generosity and sacrifice and go, man, kids, it's not about your, how many toys you have. It's about what God can do in and through us when we give our all to him. That's what it is. All right, big, big idea. It's just simply this. Generosity isn't just giving, some, giving something up. A lot of times, well, what do I got to give up? Or I got to give up my Starbucks or I got to give up a meal. That's not what it's about. Generosity isn't about giving something up, but investing in something to get something better. And that, that comes directly from the capitals and understanding that I give up financial support. I give up financial capital in order to take my friend to dinner. I give up capital resources in order to take a class so that I get smarter. Or I give up financial resources in order to get healthy because you know what, I can't, I can't buy health. But the idea that I can do things to make me healthier. The idea that, look, I want to invest and ultimately generosity is simply you investing in the kingdom. And how can you do that? Be creative. What's your next step? What's your lasting legacy as you think about generosity? To close, I think generosity leads to what I believe God's desire is, is a rich life. I think he wants us to have, I truly believe he wants us to have a rich life. But this rich life looks very different than what the world may tell you. It isn't big houses or glamour or the things that the world may tell you is successful, but the rich life is a full and fruitful life. Let me say that again. I believe God wants you to have a full and fruitful life. Scripture reveals that God wants you to be, uh, life be full of rich experiences, relationships, and kingdom investments. So when you look at what's that rich life look like for you? Like, what is it that, man, God wants you to have those experiences and God wants you to live in faith and God wants you to lean into that. A lot of you are like, well, I want, I want to see some miracles. I've never seen any miracles. And, and we said this in first service. The reason a lot of us don't see miracles is because all of us play it safe and we actually never step out in faith. Like, if you want to see miracles, step out in faith. By the way, you're living in a miracle because there were several people who said, you know what? We're going to step out in faith and, and start a church. And you're here. That in 10 years, that whatever God may put on our heart, and whenever we able, be able to build this community center that our church meets in, there are going to be hundreds to hundreds of more people who are here. And I'm going to say, get well, may, maybe y'all fire me and find a new pastor. But the new pastor might say this, that, hey, in 2022, some people stepped out in faith, and you're living in their faith, and you're living out in their obedience. That's a rich life that other people are living obedient lives because you stepped out in faith and you didn't know how you were gonna do it. And so one of the things for our family is, is for us is we said, hey, we, are, we're, we wanna travel. And so we sacrifice some things and we don't drive new cars and we live, maybe make choices different because we wanna be able to take our boys on, on experiences and we've been able to travel and, and do a lot of things and we sacrifice other things so that we can go do that. That's a part of the rich life that God's put on our heart that we can see family or, who live in, around the country and be able to do things. But then also one of the rich things that as I listened, kind of studied the last couple months and kind of asked myself what another rich life was, I heard about a pastor and, and he had talked about the idea that, that his goal was that 
um, that his generosity, his giving was the, the, number, the number one expense in his, in his budget. And I began to kind of go, man, that's an amazing rich life. Like the idea, I've always wanted to be radically generous. That's the way I've always lived. And so I began to kind of do some numbers and I talked to Betsy. I was like, hey, Betsy, what do you think our number one giving is? What do you think our number one expense is in our our budget. And she said, I don't really know. I guess our mortgage. I said, no. I was like, I'm kind of shocked by this as well. But the idea that our number one experience, our, num- our number one expense is our generosity. We give more money away. That's our number one thing. It's not our mortgage. It's not car payments. It's, it's not those things. And we've sacrificed. We could probably be in a bigger house. We could probably, but the idea that, you know what, here's the rich life for me is that I can be radically generous and I can give to God and I can do what God calls and puts on my heart. And by the way, that number is going to grow just like with a lot of you guys, because next week we're gonna write down a big number. We're gonna write down a big number. We're gonna say, all right, guess what? That number is gonna go bigger now, even in the months ahead, because we're gonna step out in faith. And I don't say that to brag, but I say that in order to go, man, this rich life is something you should lean into. This rich life of what God wants for you. Don't be a slave to your things. Don't be a slave and go, man, I really wish, I, w- I wanna help out. I wanna do those things, but when we live out our selfish desires, when it comes to resources, we're going, man, God says, hey, I want, this might look like an opportunity for you, an opportunity for you to go, man, how can we rearrange our budget? How can we begin to sacrifice? How can we pour into our kids of what that looks like? So what's it look like for you? What's your faith-filled gift look like? Is it looking at your budget? Is it uh, looking for some more opportunities? Is it simply being more disciplined in your spending? I don't know. But guess, guess what, when you, when you, whatever that number might be in, in the coming weeks that you pray about, and you go, man, well, there's no way, I, I don't really know where that number is gonna come from. It might be $2,000, it might be $5,000, it might be $10,000, it might be whatever. And you say, in the next 36 months, where am I gonna do that? But God, if God's put that on your heart, you just go, man, I'm gonna watch a miracle. I'm gonna watch God move in a mighty way. I don't really know what it looks like. We're, we're not gonna come knocking on your door because you write a number down. But that you go, all right, God, you put this number on my heart, and I want to be obedient. And begin to pray and seek the Lord of what that looks like. That's the journey we're inviting you into. We know not everybody's going to join that journey, and that's okay. Some people aren't ready. That's okay. But where are you? Where are you in this journey? Where are you going in this generosity of your heart? We've, we've cast the vision. We're giving you guys this plan Next weekend, we're going to have a, a, a weekend of, of commitment where we go, okay, here, here's what we're going to say. Let's rise up and let's build. That's where we're at. And it might be in two years, might be in five years. I don't know. This is where we give it to God. This is where we stand back and go, all right, God, it's yours. And we just want to be obedient. We're casting this vision and seeing what God can do. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Nehemiah and his wisdom to have a plan. We thank you for the fact that we've been able to do the diligence and for for people who are smarter than us to, to teach us and, and to be able to walk with us to say, hey, here's what this is gonna cost and, and here, here's what these numbers look like and be able to crunch. But just to be honest, even some of those numbers don't, don't make sense. And that's where that faith, piece, that faith piece steps in. That we would be obedient. And God, that every single person would, hears this and would, would just be obedient. And it may be just simply becoming a regular tither for, for others that may be becoming a Christ follower because that's the greatest thing that they could ever invest in is you. But the idea of going, what does it look like for us to link arms together, to rise up and to say, hey, let's build, that our hands would be strong for the good work of the Lord. And we wanna move forward in that. And so we give this to you now, Lord. We give this week to you. We pray for families as they have conversations, as they go to coffee, as they sit with their kids, as they begin to go, God, hey, here's what we're going to sacrifice. Here's what we're going to serve. Here's what this looks like. So God, we're, we're not telling anyone what they have to give. But I pray that we be obedient, whatever the Holy Spirit might put on their heart. They say, yeah, let's do it. And it may be a step of faith. And maybe we don't, they don't really know where it's gonna come from, but I think you laugh just as like you've laughed at me many, many times where I say, like, God, I don't really know how that's gonna work. And you've been so good and so faithful in that. And I stand here on the, on the promises of what you've done already. And that's why we have the courage to ask, to ask this now because of what we've seen you do for so, so many years. Here at Capstone, <laughs> through the centuries of what you've done through your church, all the way back to the promise of Jesus. You are a good God who is so faithful in his promises. So may we stand in that. May we walk in obedience. Your son's holy name.